this uh, somewhat uh, casual view of history on the part of the young people. When uh, my daughter was 16, and she was going out with a boy named Teddy, and suddenly Teddy didn't show up for a while. And I asked Lily, what happened to Teddy? How come you're not talking to him? And I haven't seen him around because I liked him. And she looked at me and said, that Teddy is history. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so <laughs> I learned my lesson. Uh, yesterday, when I went to vote in North Bennington, I could not help thinking what would be the implication of the presidential race for the confrontation between Iran and the United States. And the reason that this, this issue concerned me, and I'm sure it concerned many people, but particularly those of us who have an adopted country and a motherland, and the two seem to be at a loggerhead with each other. So we suffer twice when we think about the possibility of clash or conflict. And the reason that I was really worried, because in the last debate between President Obama and Governor Romney, they had a difference with respect to their attitude toward the use of force against Iran. President Obama said implicitly the red line for him is if Iran actually moves to possess or make nuclear weapons. And Romney said, the, the capacity to make nuclear weapon is a, a justified condition to use force. And when you say capacity, it's a very open term. It could be enrichment of uranium, could be considered the capacity. So I immediately concluded that he is definitely more prone to use force to resolve this issue than President Obama particularly given the fact that most of the people who advised him on foreign policy issues were really neoconservative personalities who had worked with President George Bush. So that was but the nature of my you know, concern. But unfortunately, late last night, I felt less uh, trouble about uh, <laughs> uh, the outcome. And you know, the claims and counterclaims surrounding this 33-year-old animosity between the two countries is currently uh, focused on Iran's nuclear program. And the, the frustration of international efforts, whether through the Security Council of the United Nations, through five plus one, so-called five permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany that have met with Iranian representatives many times over the past three years, and they haven't really reached any conclusion. And also Iran has periodically negotiated with representatives of International Atomic Energy Agency, and those negotiations have also been you know, very frustrating and not particularly you know, productive. And uh, the, the real issue here, I think it would be helpful if I just say a few words, spend two or three minutes with respect to uh, the background of this animosity, because this background is not necessarily helpful with respect to finding a solution to the current conflict and crisis, which is which has reached a dangerous point, but it gives us a clue to an understanding of the mindset and the perceptions or expectations of fear of the people who engage in such negotiations. That we need to keep in mind that the roots of the dispute between the United States and Iran go back to the Iranian Revolution of 1979 and the infamous hostage taking at the American embassy in Tehran. As we all know, Iran used to be an American ally for a quarter century. But regrettably, the problem with this alliance was that it began with Washington's interference 
illegitimate interference in internal Iranian affairs, namely the 1953 coup, the CIA-engineered coup that overthrew a democratically elected prime minister and installed the late Shah to power, ending a decade of open political competition in the country. It's a, in the minds of the Iranians, it's really, a, a, it, at, particularly at the time of, of the revolution, it was a very potent issue. It was a legitimate uh, complaint against American interference, and yet the radicals of the left and the right could abuse it, use it for their own purposes, which didn't really have anything to do with, uh, with the democratic aspirations of the early revolutionary in the coalition. Uh, the Iran's interest in nuclear power began in 1974 when the late Shah uh, contracted a six billion dollar deal with Siemens of Germany to construct a nuclear energy complex in Boucher, a city, uh, a port city on the Persian Gulf. Uh, without getting into the, the, any, the question of the, the Shah's intention also involved the military use of the energy from the very beginning, but it's very interesting and ironic that during the first year of the Iranian Revolution, when the Prime Minister Bazargan, a French-educated, genuine liberal for the, for the, as a result of the Revolutionary Coalition, for nine months he was the provisional Prime Minister and he was a physicist and he was very much opposed to nuclear energy in Iran. He thought we don't really need nuclear energy and therefore he put an end to the construction of the Boucher energy to uh, uh, facilities. And Ayatollah Khomeini, who was the ultimate authority and he didn't really know much about nuclear energy or what was going on in Boucher, but he had one principle at the time, whatever the Shah did, he could easily oppose. So Bazargan, whose opposition to this project was based on his concern for the environment and the fact that it didn't make economic sense for a country with massive oil and gas resources, he managed to convince Ayatollah uh, Khomeini that we don't need nuclear you know, facilities, we could use the resources in a different fashion. And he agreed and they put an end to it. And then the hostage crisis happened. And Bazargan, after nine months, he, was, he resigned. And the hostage taking, this a, a, not only a, a criminal act with respect to international law, but incredible cruelty against, against 53 American diplomats. It isolated Iran and in fact made Iran vulnerable to attack from Iraq. And Iraq was very much concerned, Saddam Hussein at the time, about the Iranian situation. So Iran-Iraq war started. And by, it went on, the war went on altogether for uh, eight years and Regrettably, many international players saw this war as a, fundamentally a conflict that could be perpetuated, could be, uh, uh, it could go on supporting one side or the other uh, without having any winner, as Henry Kissinger put it. He said, our interest is in that both sides lose. And the, as a result of that, during this eight-year war, 42 countries sold arms to one side or the other. 12 countries, including all five permanent members of the Security Council, sold arms to both sides. You know. In other words, not that they were responsible from my point of view. The responsibility was with Saddam Hussein and Ayatollah Khomeini, two, in my view, people who had been intoxicated with power, and they really didn't have any concern with the welfare, security, and massive cost, human and material cost of this war. And I should say parenthetically that the Iran-Iraq war is the most destructive war in the history of the Middle East region. It had almost a million casualties. It went on for eight years. But in 1984, Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against Iranians as well as against Iraqi courts. As a result of that, the Iranian, by that time, the radicals had come to power and the 
the liberal moderate forces were either in jail or out of the country or executed by this time. So they decided to revive Iranian nuclear program. From 1984 on, they went to North Korea, Pakistan, Russia, China, and one important you know, uh, uh, Pakistani, uh, general Pakistani nuclear physicist was very helpful to Iranians. So this program started in mid-1980s. And by mid-1990s, it became clear to the International Atomic Energy Agency as well as the United States and Israel, that Iran was really making significant progress in uh, its nuclear you know, program, and particularly with respect to enrichment of uranium, which is the key material for making in you know, a bomb. However, to this day, the Iranian regime claims that it has no intention of making nuclear weapons, that they simply want nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, and uh, they even say using religious text and religious tradition and coding the Quran, saying that uh, it would be against the religious principles to make nuclear weapons. They make these claims, but there is a concept in Shi'i Islam, which it can be used exactly like what the totalitarian, particularly the Marxist Leninist, often use this, it ends justify the means. So in this particular tradition, it is permissible for a believer to misrepresent something, or to lie about something, if the end is noble and justified which is not at all, it's a very Machiavellian concept, but in this particular instance, it could even have religious connotations or religious vocabulary can be used to justify something which human animals have been doing from time immemorial and each culture and each society has its own way of justifying, uh, saying ends justify the means. So there is this suspicion that Iranians are not really telling the truth, particularly since there is not enough transparency in the nuclear facilities, even though Iran is signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Representatives of International Atomic Energy are in Iran, but there are some facilities that are close to the observers and the inspectors of International Atomic Energy Agency. As a result of that, numerous reports of International Atomic Energy Agency about Iranian nuclear program leaves enough ambiguity and questions that this suspicion toward Iranian you know, intention is perpetuated and is believed by a variety of people, including many scientists. In, uh, and it is the fact that we know today that Iran can enrich uranium up to 20%. And based on everything I have read, particularly through the uh, website, a very reliable website, the Union of uh, Atomic Scientists, that they have been interested in the nuclear issue for 50 years. And according to them, any country, any society that is capable of, capable of enriching uranium up to 20% has the capacity to enrich it to 90%, 95%, which is necessary for you know, bomb making. So far, Iranians have enriched uranium up to 20%, but there is no evidence that uh, they have gone beyond that. In fact, uh, when we look at uh, the, for example, according to the National Intelligence Estimate, a synthesized compilation of data evaluated by America's 17 intelligence agencies issued in 2007 stated that, quote, we judge with high confidence that in fall 2003, Iran halted its nuclear weapons program, and in 2011, the NIE declared that there were no serious revisions to its 2007 report, which was issued in November 2007. Moreover, several senior Israeli officials have said in recent weeks that they have come around to the U.S. view that no final decision to build a bomb 
has been made by Iran. Uh, in other words, the reports of the International Atomic Energy Agency confirm the NIE estimate, and yet in their reports, there is ambiguous language. There are questions that Iranians refuse to answer. So the doubt and suspicion to this day yeah, continues. Uh, the Iran, in, in order to, to the, this, the theocratic, uh, uh, the theocratic order in Iran, we have to understand the mindset and the nature of this regime in order to hope, as I'm hopeful, for a negotiated settlement of this uh, dispute, is that the theocratic order in Iran is both dogmatic and pragmatic. When we listen to their propaganda, when the claims they make, they use very abstract, very religious, very metaphysical you know, language to talk about their purposes, to talk about their mission, like religious fundamentalists everywhere. The vocabulary is almost a metaphysical vocabulary. It has very little to do in their propaganda with the realities of the world. But at the same time, Iran's leaders are fanatically resentful of Western socio-cultural values. Here, religious fundamentalists, Islamic fundamentalists, that not that representing a minority of the population in the, in the Islamic world, but they are very active, and their resentment toward the Western world is very different for, from the kind of criticism or resentment that we found in the leftist groups in the past. It's largely cultural. It has very little to do with, uh, with, even, with economic or even security matters that Iran's fear of Western cultural influence on the Iranian society, which uh, is very pervasive, uh, and in fact, under the Islamic Republic, it has been far more, the Western cultural values have been far more influential than ever before as a result of satellite television, contact with the outside world, and the internet. But it's, uh, to understand the nature of this regime, they also are very pragmatic. And let me give you some examples. For example, the Iranians are adamant in their defense of Palestinian rights because they use this particular topic in order to gain support among the Arab general publics in the Arab world. And it works. Usually, whoever criticizes Israel condemns Israel for its territorial expansionism or treatment of Palestinians can have a real sympathetic audience in the Arab world. Exactly for that reason, it can also be abused. People, in order to generate public sentiment in the Arab world, it's a very useful uh, uh, way of doing it. At the same time, when Russians killed the Muslims in Ch Chechnya, or when the Chinese kill Muslims in China, Iranians say, this is an internal affair. Mm -hmm. We do not inter While defense of the Palestinian is always in the name of Islam, in the name of revealed truth and the rest, but not uh, uh, when it comes to China and Russia. Why? Because in the Security Council, which Iran's nuclear issue is constantly being discussed, Iran relies on China and Russia in order to prevent the passage of the kind of resolutions that would consider Iran's nuclear program to be a threat to international peace and security. And also, China is a major buyer of Iranian oil. And Russia finds Iran as a fantastic market for its arms. So here, the, the theologians who seem to be living in the meta metaphysical universe one day, the next day they're engaging in political activities and give and take of conventional international politics like everybody else. Another example I can give you with respect to this, the pragmatic or even Machiavellian nature of this theocratic order, after 9-11, Iran had, before 9-11, Iran had two enemies, Saddam Hussein and Taliban. And with the Taliban, with Saddam Hussein, they had fought for eight years. With Taliban, they were almost, they went to war. And there were Iran, 11 Iranian diplomats were arrested by the Taliban and they were executed. And they were very close to 
military you know, clash. And when the United States, after 9-11, decided to uh, invade Afghanistan, Iran played a very helpful role, very helpful role, to the extent that American commanders actually expressed their appreciation and thank to the Iranian. This, three years later, in March 2003, when Iran invaded Iraq, when the United States invaded Iraq, Iran was very helpful in the Persian Gulf region. So here, in both, why? Because here, the United States and Iran were enemies, and yet, in overthrowing Saddam Hussein and overthrowing the Taliban, they had convergence and confluence of interest. And ironically, this is also a period that a reformist movement in Iran from 1997, Mohammad Khatami, who was a cleric, but definitely a more moderate, a cleric who wanted to normalize Iranian relationship with Europe and the United States, and also put an end to this confrontational foreign policy Iran had been, been following. And he had some success, particularly inside the country. There was a genuine uh, opening of political discussion inside the country. Political prisoners were released. And he also approached uh, the Bush administration to, to see if a movement toward reconciliation, rapprochement, can take place. Ironically, in 2002, President Bush issued his famous statement of including Iran in the axis of evil. And Khatami was opposed by his radical critics inside the country. So President Bush's decision helped the, just as invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan was true two Christmas presents to the theocracy in Iran. And here, this time, the rejection of the Khatami's uh, effort to contact the United States, to engage the United States, led to, gave the radical elements in Iran to use it to discredit him. And they actually succeeded. And later on, in fact, after uh, the Iraqi invasion in March 2003, he is still managed to persuade his critics and to persuade Ayatollah Khamenei. To, he sent a letter to uh, President Bush and made specific suggestions about negotiations over the nuclear issue, as well as other complaints and concerns the United States had with respect to Iran. President Bush did not even answer the letter. It's because at that time, in March 2003, the United States had significant successes in Afghanistan and Iraq in the early stages period of, of uh, the invasion. And Iran was next on the list. And particularly, Dick Cheney and a number of other neoconservatives were pushing invasion of Iran and doing the same thing to Iran as they did to Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. And here, Iranians were really afraid. Iran was in a weak position. They thought, wow, it was so quick to get rid of Saddam Hussein and the Taliban. They might be able to do the same thing here. So Khatami used that concern, which was very pervasive in Iran at the time during the first year or two of the invasion of Iraq, in order to persuade them that this is the time for rapprochement and for, convict, for contact with the United States. Regrettably, President Bush rejected it completely. And as time went on, as we know, uh, Iraq was not as easy as they thought. And in fact, Iran ended up being very influential in the Iraqi affairs. And it continues to be, the, in other words, the, the, the civil war or the violence in Iraq, the counterinsurgency efforts, and after all, 60%, 70% of the Iraqi people were Shi'i Muslims, and they were governed by the Sunnis, who constituted only 15% of the population. And the other 15% were Kurds, who were also oppressed and marginalized by you know, uh, Saddam Hussein. So in fact, the, the, the conflict in Iraq and the coming to power of the Shi'is of Iraq led to a great deal of arrogance on the part of the Iranian. They changed their position. And later on, when President 
Obama came to power, he was very generous. He sent a letter to the Iranian authorities, particularly Ayatollah uh, Khamenei, and as he had promised during his campaign four years ago, that he wants to negotiate and find a peaceful solution to Iran's nuclear dilemma, uh, he sent the letter and they didn't respond to, <laughs> to uh, at this time, the, the arrogance in Iran had reached the level that they thought the United States, they, they perceived this as indication of weakness, not the commitment of one president to pursue a peaceful resolution of the conflict. So President Obama was really very disappointed. He started his presidency, in my opinion, with respect to his Middle Eastern policies, with a great deal of goodwill and uh, the effort to uh, reconciliation with Iranians and others, and then he, came, he gradually came to realize that the problems are more complicated, and the behavior of some of these regimes have to do with the internal situation. You know, that in Iran, for example, anti-Americanism has become an integral part of the, of the regime. And for the past 33 years, they have been propagating this anti-American uh, attitude and saying that the United States is uh, 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 committed to regime change in Iran. So the security and coercive apparatus of the state has come to see the United States as a power intent on regime change you know, in the country, to the extent that it has become extremely difficult for the Iranian regime to change its position, because as time goes on over the past 33 years, they have lost a great deal of, pop of uh, popular support, uh, but they have had, I would say, uh, two fundamental advantages in order to perpetuate their intransigence. One has to do with the increase in price of oil. Over the past seven, eight years, Iran has received more money from oil experts, over $500 billion, than in the previous 40 years the country had received. You know. And this money is immensely helpful with respect to supporting the coercive and intelligence apparatus of the state, and also the, giving them a, a kind of uh, the economic capability that they could helping, for example, they have given over $5 billion in economic and military aid to Syria, as well as aid to Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, and to some extent, even assistance to Hamas. So the, the money not only has helped Iran with respect to its, the satisfaction of its internal needs, as well as it and the, the apparatus of the state, but also with respect to its foreign policy. And in addition to that, at least since the collapse of Saddam Hussein and the collapse of Taliban has really given Iran a, kind of a sense of security within its own regime. Iran is very aggressive with respect to its uh, propaganda, with respect to its vocabulary, with respect to its claims. But over the past 33 years, Iran has not committed an act of aggression against another country. It has committed criminal acts against Iranian dissidents, both inside and outside the country, but it has not acted aggressively against any neighbor of uh, uh, the country. So in the American re response with respect to the, the nuclear issue, moved both beginning with uh, with the Bush administration was sanctioning Iran, economic you know, sanctions and political isolation. Sanctions are not ends in themselves. Sanctions are used in order to change behavior of a state. And these sanctions have been going on for the past 15 years, and they have been significantly intensified and effective over the past two years. Iran used to produce 3.5 million barrels of oil a day, and export close to 2.4 million barrels a day. Today, Iran's oil production has come down to less than 2 million barrels a day, and the latest number I saw, Iran is exporting about 1 million barrels a day, then less than half of what it was doing 
two years ago, largely due to sanctions imposed on Iran, not only with respect to uh, uh, the Iranian oil, but also the <laughs> banking, to the extent that even ch a country like China, a country like South Korea, India and Turkey, they engage in barter trade with Iran. They buy oil, and in exchange for the oil, they export their commodities and their consumer goods to Iran because the sanctioning of the Iranian central bank has made it very difficult for Iran to receive uh, dollar currency, it, to, uh, which it has been receiving. So sanctions definitely have weakened Iran. But it is very doubtful that sanctions could lead to uh, uh, Iran's submission to American demands. It is extremely unlikely. And a good example, we have sanctions against Saddam Hussein from 1990 to 2003 were immensely effective to the extent that at the end when the Iraqis were suffering due to lack of food and medicine, the United States and the, Interna the Security Council agreed to sell Iraqi oil only in exchange for food and uh, medicine because people were suffering in Iraq. And yet the regime didn't bend. The regime didn't blink at all. Re this is more or less the same expectation one could have from Iran. So long as they can produce oil, there is enough buyer in the black market for Iran to sell its oil and satisfy its needs. And the regime in Iran does not really care what happens to the public at large at this, to this point. The, it's, the, the sacrifice or the suffering of the general public is justified in the name of nationalism, in the name of Islam, in the name of defending the country against the enemies and so forth. So far, at least it could, the unemployment in Iran has reached the, probably 25%, particularly in a country where 70% of the people are under 30 years old. The country is very young. The population has doubled over the past 30 years. So the unemployment is largely a problem for young people you know, in Iran. And also inflation. Inflation and the Iranian currency have suffered dramatically in recent years as a result of sanctions. But there is absolutely no evidence that these sanctions are persuading the Iranian authorities to compromise and to move toward resolution of this conflict either in a direct negotiation with the United States or through International Atomic Energy Agency of 5 plus 1, that is Security Council Group and uh, uh, Germany. So here, uh, if sanctions are supposed to change behavior, and the behavior is not changing. And at the same time, both Republican and Democratic presidents, as well as foreign policy elite in, the, in both administrations, past and present, have said that Iran with nuclear weapons is unacceptable. That is to say, they have rejected the idea of containment with respect to Iran what the United States did with respect to development of nuclear weapons in China or in the Soviet Union, that they contained them. With respect to Iran, they say containment will not work and we will not do it. Why? Because they think Iran is irrational, that Iran is suicidal. Because there are many political students of international relations who say proliferation of nuclear weapons could even increase international security because nuclear weapons are instruments of collective suicide, and no country would want to use nuclear weapons because the retaliation means the destruction of that country, and they are not ready to pay that price. But if you assume that irrational people, suicidal people, have uh, weapons, uh, then you say containment in this area is not logical. However, there is absolutely no evidence that the Iranians are, Iranian leaders and rulers are any more suicidal than American rulers or British rulers or Russian rulers or Chinese rulers. Absolutely not. There is as much corruption and inequality in Iran, concentration of wealth in Iran over the past 33 years is more skewed than ever before. Corruption in the Iranian regime, a struggle for power, competition, back, the normal, uh, 
uh, the affairs of politics in an autocratic state and also increasing suppression of, uh, of the dissidents and the dissatisfaction of the society which is increasing. Uh, we all have heard about clash of civilizations, the Samuel Huntington's idea that particularly the neoconservatives use. They use the idea of clash of civilization to say the, our confrontation with a country like Iran is not uh, based on uh, conflict of interest or issues of security, because conflicts of interest and issues of security could be settled through negotiation. But if it's civilizational and the other side is suicidal, then uh, uh, war seems to be the only way to deal with them. But what is ha actually happening in Iran, there is definitely in Iran, as well as in my opinion, in the Arab countries, uh, in, in, in Arab countries of the Middle East, there is definitely a clash of civilizations, but it is internal. There is a clash of civilization inside Iran, inside Egypt, inside Syria. People who are the Islamist radicals who are, in a sense, radical restorationists. That is, they want to return. The Iranian revolution had a, some a, a, an attribute that was really missing in other major revolutions of the world, in the American Revolution, in the French Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, the, America, the Russian Revolution, the Cuban Revolution. The claim was we want to create a society that has never existed before, that it's a utopian project and we are creating something new. In Iran, with the religious fundamentalists, when they eliminated the liberals and moderates and the leftists, they became restorationists. They said, we want to return to the pristine and utopian state of the early Islam. In fact, religious fundamentalists, whether they're Christians or Jews or Muslims, they, had, they share one very significant tendency. And it, the said tendency is that, unlike most of us who, uh, uh, who remember the past and imagine the future, they reverse this. They uh, imagine the, <laughs> the they remember, the, the reverse it. <laughs> instead of, re, instead of uh, the, the remembering the past and imagining the future, they imagine the past and remember the future. <laughs> In other words, that which existed early in fundamentalist uh, uh, images, they are really largely the product of their imagination. It has absolutely nothing to do with history, whether it's fundamentalist Judaism, fundamentalist Christianity, or fundamentalist you know, Islam. Therefore, they want to return to that. While at the same time, Iran is a country with a significant middle class, with a very impressive intellectual culture, a culture that produces a film like Separation and many other <laughs> films of that nature. They understand irony, they understand paradox, and this m modern movement in Iran is at least a century old. The, after the Iranian revolution, over three and a half million Iranians have left the country, largely middle class, not of, for political reasons, mostly, in my opinion, for cultural reasons, because in Iran, the regime is not an autocratic regime which wants submission from the citizens in order to rule. That is, an, uh, that is a traditional dictatorship. In Iran, it's a fundamentalist regime that they interfere in the private sphere of life. What you do in your bedroom is the business of government. The way you dress is a business of government. Whether you kiss your friend is a business of government. That a great deal of resources in Iran are devoted to, to control people or to make sure that no unholy uh, or irreligious behavior takes place in the public, uh, public space. You know. So it's that kind of a regime. Yes, there is no question that there is this crisis of civilization inside the country. And if we read the Egyptian newspapers these days after the revolution, we see exactly the same thing, not to the same extent, but the, the people who uh, use 
the fundamentalist radical religion is who represent the minority of the people. The president of Egypt, who is a moderate Muslim, who is a moderate Islamist, uh, Mohammed Morsi, he was actually a professor in, in California, so he knows the West. Here, he only received 24% of the vote to win the presidency. It's because the liberals and the leftists and the moderates were so fragmented. There were 12 other candidates. They split the votes. And he ended up becoming president with 20% of the vote. So these people are well organized. And they have resources at their disposal. A great deal of resources at disposal comes from Saudi Arabia and other old rich countries of the Persian Gulf region. So here, the Iranian regime, because of this opposition to the cultural influence of the West and resentment toward the more modern sector of the society, it really finds this confrontation with the West useful in order to uh, justify the suppression of the dissidents and also fear of, of Western culture you know, influence. Otherwise, when it comes to economic relations, the, the kind of deals that China and Russia and other countries are making with the other far more exploitative and unequal than if the, the trade relations we all had with the Western world you know, in the past. So what is the option? And here, if we are dealing with a, an irrational suicidal regime, which is not at all the case, but if this is the assumption and sanctions do not work, then we are going to observe to see the possibility of another war in the Middle East. But here, I think the policymakers in the United States, and definitely President you know, Obama, and many other policymakers, after the experience of Iraq and Afghanistan, they have come to see that this is really a, 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 this is not a rational option. They can, it's possible for the United States to bomb Iran's nuclear facilities, but Iran is going to retaliate against American target in the Persian Gulf region, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. And the United States will have to enter Iran, that is, boots on the ground, the invasion of Iran. And Iran is a very large country. It has a significant military and resources at its disposal. And the only conceivable way that Iran, the United States could make absolutely certain that Iran will not be able to enrich uranium, put an end to its nuclear program, is to invade the country with at least a million soldiers. And there are many, I don't want to bother you with quotations, many American military leaders, Israeli military leaders, are also in the same opinion that war against Iran would have very negative consequences for American policies in the region. And sometimes they clear, they argue that even if Iran's nuclear facilities are bombed and destroyed, it will only postpone the, the Iran's nuclear program for a couple of years. The first thing Iran will do if there is any kind of military attack on Iran is to withdraw from the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty. The, the inspectors of International Atomic Energy Agency will leave Iran completely. So Iran will have complete freedom to do, to engage in enrichment of uranium to the level necessary for you know, bomb making. And it's, if in Iraq and in Afghanistan where the conditions were very different, we observed the human tragedy of invading. So American officials are having serious concerns and serious uh, considerations about what are the concerns. And this is exactly what Obama is saying. We are not doing anything unless Iran is actually having, is moving toward weapon making. And if there is absolutely no evidence that Iran is moving in that direction. And yet, I genuinely believe that given the nature of the Iranian regime, that it has a pragmatic side. It's possible, particularly now that the election is over, and uh, perhaps you know, the, elect the campaign is a kind of, it has a paralyzing impact on foreign policy making as well as domestic, because whatever move they make, they don't know what kind of negative consequences it will have for the election. That I would say after election, President Obama has an easier time to deal you know, with Iran. And I don't think dealing with Iran means uh, uh, rapprochement in the sense that the two countries can move toward 
uh, normalization of relations and re-establishment of diplomatic relations. Regrettably, I don't see that possibility so long as the present leaders in Iran remain in control. And it is a matter of time. In, the Iranian came to power saying Islam is the answer, not only to the moral issues they had in mind, but to issues of poverty, to issues of inequality, to issues of housing, to issues of health care, to social economic issues that concern human beings in every society in the world. And they have failed in every area when it comes to this populistic vocabulary they use in order to raise expectations in the country, and the failure is pervasive. Sooner or later, this regime will also come against uh, the wall, it's how long, nobody knows exactly how long. So the strategy of the United States, in my opinion, should be to move toward Iran to diffuse the nuclear issue. That is to say, to engage in reciprocal, and I happen to believe that Iranians are, because of the really destructive consequences, negative consequences of the sanctions, and these sanctions are going to hurt Iran more and more as time goes on. Uh, there is no new investment in Iran. Even Iranian capitalists themselves are not willing to invest in the country because they fear there is going to be a military, a military conflict between Iran and Israel or Iran and the United States, and they are not investing. And the regime is also having serious economic problems and budgetary issues. So they're, and they act if the pragmatic side, the Machiavellian side, persuade them that if the regime is in danger, Khomeini said under no circumstances he would accept ceasefire with Iraq until they came to him and said, we cannot defend ourselves and the regime is in danger of being disintegrated. He signed it. He said it was, a sh I, it was like drinking poison when he signed and agreed with the, uh, with the ceasefire with Iraq. So m moving, uh, engaging Iran in a very step-by-step step, in the fashion that lifting or waiving sanctions in a very reciprocal fashion that, for example, if Iran could ship out the, the, its uh, stock part of enriched, 20 percent enriched uranium. And I genuinely believe there is such a possibility. If Iran could at least suspend its enrichment facilities for a given you know, period of time. And in response to that, the United States could lift sanctions or, uh, that is minimizing the, pol the political uh, the isolation and the economic sanctions against Iran. And there are many, uh, the, the Iranians are also sending directly and indirectly signs both to the European countries as well as to the United States that uh, they are ready to negotiate, except that they say, lift all the sanctions before we are listen, we listen to your demands. So I would say in the new administration, the movement toward uh, uh, the, the, the diffusion of the nuclear crisis without really having the ambition of repeating what Nixon and Kissinger did with China, some analyst see Iran as a conventional political uh, 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 regime that would be willing to engage in negotiation and settlements of the conflict the way China did. China was not afraid of American or Western culture. They had dif the different you know, concerns. So the China model cannot be repeated with respect to Iran, in my opinion, but Iranians are definitely in pursuit of their own interest and protection of the regime in the short run, it's possible to reach an agreement that they would give up enrichment of uranium and accept, uh, the, uh, open up all nuclear facilities to uh, the inspectors of International you know, Atomic you know, Energy Agency uh, so that the concern of the Western world, the concern of the United States with respect to Iran gaining nuclear weapon and starting a nuclear arms race in the Middle East region will significantly diminish, at least for a period of time until there is, Iran is pregnant with change. We do, when, we don't know. But Iran is not going to stay the way you know, it is. The only problem uh, that we face that I genuinely fear that this problem could prevent President Obama and the United States 
to uh, seek uh, uh, the kind of solution that Iran remains intransigent and Iran could continue its, its uh, propaganda against Israel and the United States, but satisfy the United States' concern with respect to its nuclear enrichment and nuclear program. So that Iran could say, we are not compromising. They need the, the kind of agreement. They have to reach the kind of agreement that each side can go home and justify it in, with respect to its own uh, constituents. This is far more important to the Iranians than to the United States. The threat, the fear is that because in Iran, anti-Israeli propaganda in Iran is vicious, and some of the incendiary and absurd statements that President Ahmadinejad, who is absolutely nobody in Iran, he is a big guy in New York every time he comes, and everybody wants to interview him. But you go to Iran, and he has absolutely no power, <laughs> particularly in the area of foreign policy. He is just, no, he's completely marginal. They're actually, his term will be over in about six, seven months. They're trying to impeach him because of the differences over material economic issues related to economic competition within the, the regime. But when he comes to New York, and the reason that American media loves him so much, he has become a, a household uh, name in, in the United States, because he has two qualities, two attributes that appeal to American mass media. One is that he could be used as a, uh, as a boogeyman. You know, he wants to kill everybody, he denies Holocaust, he wants to destroy Israel. So a boogeyman like that is a very marketable commodity, particularly for late night shows. <laughs> the absolute. <laughs> uh, John Stewart, uh, Jay Leno, and David Letterman, they all love him when he is in New York. That's one side. The other side of him that is equally is indispensable for his appeal, particularly to the late night show, that he is a clown. He gives a lecture at UC, at, at University of, uh, at Columbia University, and says, there are no gays in Iran. You know. <laughs> so imagine what the late night showman could do with this sentence. <laughs> so he says many absurd things. And he is also very threatening. So he has been a personality in American mass media, while no power to influence policy in his own uh, country at all. And yet, if you live in Israel, if you have the consciousness of a people who were excluded and oppressed for 2,000 years, the people who experienced the Holocaust, when they hear somebody in the process having the potential to make nuclear weapons and also saying that we want to destroy you, we want to, we want to wipe off the Israel from the map, you're not going to take, he's no longer a clown. I mean, that threat, something when the Iranian officials in the Friday prayer sermons or Ahmadinejad in New York say, we could laugh about it because it has absolutely no relationship with the capacity. But even if Iran makes one nuclear weapon, and that nuclear weapon could be used against a country like Israel. So the fear in Israel is understandable and legitimate, even though, in my opinion, it really has no foundation with respect to the capacity of Iranians or intentions of, because the Iranian regime absolutely doesn't want to do anything to be destroyed. That is, imagining attacking Israel means the end of the Iranian regime. They will not do that, and yet this propaganda is useful to Iranians because it is through this propaganda that they project themselves in the Arab world as a revolutionary Islamic regime, confronting the Western, the great Satan, confronting the Israelis. It's all propaganda. It has, it, it's emotionally satisfying in a momentary fashion, but it's not connected to power and capacity to do anything. That kind of propaganda in international relations as well as national politics can be useful can satisfy egotistical aims and all that, even though it will not have any policy or action-oriented consequences. So the Israelis are concerned, and Netanyahu is using it, and also, he's also exaggerating it, but nevertheless, for his domestic politics, as well as the genuine concern of the people in Israel, he says, we cannot, under any circumstances, we cannot trust Iran. And therefore, we need a red line from the United States. And Israel knows that Israel alone cannot 
go to war against Iran. It's too far away, and uh, it could be very costly, and the, the result could be minimal or insignificant. So the only conceivable way that Israel could completely achieve its purpose with respect to destroying Iran's potential to move toward the, at least gaining the capacity to make nuclear weapons is to involve the United States, to involve the United States. And so far, Obama has resisted it. Mm -hmm. So far, he has resisted. He says, he doesn't, he says, he, and for if you, those of you who watched Mr. Netanyahu's speech in the United Nations, uh, three weeks ago, he was very, he was illustrating with, uh, with some objects and painting and all that, that the Iranians are very close to making the bomb. And this is the time for the Western world, not only the United States, but also Western Europe, to establish a red line and say, going beyond it, you will face nuclear attack and retaliation from the Western world. When and how that it, it's, uh, but the only conceivable way, in my opinion, to put an end to the legitimate concern of the Israeli people, as well as the exploitation of this legitimate concern by Israeli politicians, because many Israeli politicians and generals are categorically opposed to attacking Iran, because they make their judgments on the basis of the results and the consequences and the cost, and the cost-benefit analysis for them doesn't justify it at all. And yet the fear is there, and the use of that fear from time immemorial, politicians have used fear in order to advance their interest. It is happening in Israel with respect to Iran. The fear is justified, and it is being, it is being exaggerated and used for political purposes. The only way to put an end to that concern is what I suggested, is an approach by the Obama administration to Iran, engaging Iran in a very limited and realistic way of giving Iran, lifting sanctions and giving Iran some relief from economic, heavy economic pressure the country is under in exchange for the kind of tangible and verifiable moves Iran can make with respect to its nuclear program that at least for a given period of time, one can be certain that Iran is not moving toward enrichment of uranium toward 90%, which is necessary for weapon making. This is the only option that I see could uh, eliminate the, the danger of another war in the Middle East, which would be a disaster not only for the Iranians, but also for the United States and its interests in the region. Thank you very much. I will be happy to share more of my confusion with you. <laughs> Yes. <clears throat> your phone rings tomorrow morning and it's the White House on your on your phone asking you for one specific thing that they would like to do before the week is out. What would you recommend? I would recommend asking Iranians what kind of sanctions do you want me to lift in response to which you will make a specific effort mm -hmm. to reduce my concern about your program. Mm -hmm. And Iranians have a list that it is a response to what they are desperately seeking to get with respect to uh, reduction of pressure ec economically, because in, they are afraid that this economic pressure in Iran is going to lead to greater dissatisfaction within the country, as it has already happened. And therefore, it will be a great, Iran already has problem with a growing dissident movement, democratic movement inside the country, and they really don't want the urban pool to join. This movement is largely middle class, educated, the modernist sectors. They don't want the educated modernist sector to get the support of the urban poor in the country. And in Tehran, a population of 12 million, 75% of them can be considered urban poor. And the economic sanctions are hurting them. Iran is importing food and importing medicine to satisfy its needs. So there are ways of, the, the United States has incentives in order to, uh, to persuade Iran to make uh, specific steps toward reduction, step by step. That's what I, I don't know exactly what Iranians want, but there is no doubt in my mind that they have a list and the White House could easily get hold of the list. Yeah. I, I 
I appreciate and I'm grateful for many of the things that we've said, especially about the Iranians not being irrational and suicidal. Um, but if Obama did do that, um, people would jump all over him as not supporting Israel. Well, I don't think so. I mean, in, in Israel, the majority of American people, survey research shows that the majority, 73% of American people, based on the last survey research I saw, 73% of American people are opposed to another war in the Middle East. Oh, oh, in Israel, in Israel, 50% of the people were opposed to attack on, on, on Iran, and they said, if, even with the assistance of the United States and attacking it alone, 70% of Israelis were opposed to it. They are concerned, but they think the diplomatic option, the pursuit of diplomatic uh, pressure, diplomatic or sanctions and diplomacy and politics, they have not been exhausted at all. And in Israel, I would say it is in the best interest of Israel to avoid another war in the region. So it regrettably, many critics of Netanyahu, including many general, many high-level intelligence officials, that I have their names and all that, that, this is not the place to provide documentation and all that, many of these people are constantly criticizing Netanyahu for being so, such a warmonger mm -hmm. with respect to Iran. So Obama, if by doing that, he is actually serving the interests of the Israeli people, because there is no evidence right now. There is absolutely no evidence, as I indicated, American intelligence community, Israeli intelligence officials, European intelligence, there is not an iota of evidence that Iran is close to gaining the capacity to make nuclear weapons. Well, there is sympathy. There is, you know, it's the Congress. I think, in fact, if the, whoever becomes president, including President Bush, the, during his first term, he didn't pay any attention to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In his second term, particularly after Iraq, and he was pressured by many Arab allies of the United States that this conflict is really a, a source of constant problem and delegitimization of the regime. He tried toward the very toward the end of his second term, he tried to bring about the resolution of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. So did his father. You know. So it's, it's the Congress of the United States which is unconditionally supportive of the most right-wing political forces in Israel, and they pay no attention to the more moderate forces in Israel that really want reading the Israeli. In Israel, there is a fantastic debate going on. I've been to Israel, to the university. People debate these things very openly. We don't see that in the United States. Uh, there is a taboo in the United States with respect to an open debate about uh, uh, Israeli treatment of Palestinians. And there is some Palestinians were guilty of committing crimes and being terrorists, but not even 1% of Palestinians have ever committed crime, but nevertheless, they have come to define the image of Palestinian in the United States. So when most Americans think about Palestinians, they can think about an irrational suicidal terrorist. While in reality, in the, on the way, the three and a half million people living on the West Bank and Gaza Strip, the only population group in the entire world without a nationality. They don't have a passport. They're stateless. The only population group in the And who are they? 92, 93% of them were small children or born after 1967. That they know nothing of life except existence under Israeli military occupation. 
and Israeli military occupation on the West Bank that I have observed is really very harsh and very dehumanizing for the people who have to go through that experience, spending hours and hours and hours going through the checkpoints. So it's, a, it's that reality that the United States understands that there is no question that the policymakers understand all of these things, and yet it's, it's fundamentally up to the Israel. Israel has the upper hand, and Israel at the present time is not interested in negotiation. <laughs> I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree with it. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I, if you ask me, I'm, I think the United States must have a security <coughs> alliance with Israel. An attack on Israel should be considered an attack on the United States. This is my point. And yet, the, in order to really protect and secure Israel, it is really important for the people who have suffered from oppression, marginalization, expulsion, genocide, more than any other population group in the world, one expects them to be more fair when they are in the position of power. Amen. <laughs> but, yeah, anyway, but let's move on to the... No, no, not no. let me. I wanted to do, yeah, please. <laughs> okay, please. Uh, uh, I'm curious how, what Iran is saying now is the reason that they wanted to have uh, the, military, the military capacity to use nuclear weapons. Uh, they, you said they started doing that as a response to uh, Saddam's chemical use of right. chemical weapons. So that was defensive. So in other words, they wanted to defend themselves against enemies who might attack them. That seems like a reasonable thing. Who do they think is there, who's going to attack, who do they feel is going to attack them now? Or has it just become part of their own sense of uh, statehood and more like North Korea, where they use it as a p place to say, pay attention to me, I'm important, I'm, I'm a big player. I'm a well, it's, first of all, they claim that they have no intention of doing that. That's first. They claim that they have no intention of doing it. And there is no evidence that they are doing that. And yet, they seem to have the capacity to move in that direction. They have the science, they have the scientists, they have the facilities, and they have produced enriched uranium up to 20%. That is, potentially, it's a political decision for them to move in that direction. And if you ask me, there is no question in my mind that this is an option for them. Why they want it? Because having deterrence, it's, a, it's the ultimate deterrence. That is, if you have nuclear weapons, nobody is going to attack you. And all the countries feel that. Because yeah. when the United States, when George Bush said, access of evil included mm -hmm. Syria, included Iraq and Iran and uh, North Korea, Iraq, they attacked and destroyed it, so did with respect to Afghanistan, but they didn't do anything about North Korea because North Korea had nuclear weapons and they didn't want to see any retaliation against American allies in, in South Korea. So, and that is, it's Iran, there are, the, there are about 35 countries that have the capacity to make nuclear weapons. A country like Germany or Japan, they can make a nuclear weapon in a long weekend. <laughs> Absolutely. They, in, these countries, enrichment, a country like Brazil, a country like Argentina, a country like Chile, a country like South Africa, Israel has nuclear weapons. So they, they, but it is not in their security interest to do it because they have the protection and they don't feel any threat with respect to, let's say, Germany or Japan. It's the, the, it's the <laughs> nuclear umbrella of the United States and Latin American countries that definitely have the capacity to do it, they decide not to do it because it doesn't serve them. But in the Middle East region, that here is this revolutionary regime with ambition of exporting its revolution, not through military force, but through propaganda mm -hmm. to play a role in the region. And here sitting in Iran, look, Iraq was invaded and the regime was changed, even though they loved it. But nevertheless, it happened. On the other side is in Afghanistan. The same thing. Having nuclear deterrent means the ultimate protection against the possibility. 
And there is enough paranoia in Iran. There is enough paranoia. Because they are paranoid simply because of what they do to their own people and what fundamentally the kind of confrontation they have with, a number, with many re countries in the region. It's a still, Iran is a still a revolutionary regime run and managed by the first generation of the most radical elements who participate in that revolution. I would assume that if they can get away with it, they would love to have nuclear deterrent. But right now, they haven't moved in that direction because they fear retaliation of the United States and Europe, as well as Israel, if there is solid, verifiable evidence that they're moving in that direction. So there is no evidence they're doing it. And yet, uh, these are managers of power. And they are pragmatic and Machiavellian like many other politicians across the board. And they think if they have it, particularly after eight years of devastation in the war with Iraq, and that what Iraq used chemical weapons. Where did he get his weapons? Where did he, where did he get it? From the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Revolutionary guards at all? Isn't right. that a, isn't that an army within the within an army and runs the country so to speak? Absolutely. And I have one more question to add to that, at least, if I may. Uh, where is the line between the bluff and the real politics, and who runs it? Because I mean, we're talking in the Middle East, right. people bargain back and forth. Right. Where is the real McCoy? Here? The real McCoy is Ayatollah Khomeini. He is the he is the man with power. And he is the man who appoints the leaders of the Revolutionary Guard. The Revolutionary Guards is not simply, they have become the Praetorian Guard of the Islamic Republic. Second, they control over 40% of the Iranian economy. Because Iran is a rentier state. The bulk of the state resources come from export of one commodity. And the Revolutionary Guards protect the regime. And the, the clerical elements, this fragmentation and division within many of the people who served the regime for 20 years they are in jail. So they are constantly fighting amongst themselves. And yet, Ayatollah Khamenei, the revolution, the, the supreme leader, he seems to have complete control over the revolutionary guards and the intelligence apparatus. Altogether, they come to about 400,000 people. And it is the old money that has enabled them to have such an organization and to support it and to actually create a new class of wealthy people in Iran. And many of them are belong to the revolutionary guards, to the intelligence apparatus, or their relatives. So we are talking about, and in, in my opinion, after Khamenei does, we are going to see a military coup in Iran. That is to say, it is not the turban that is going to rule Iran in two or three or five years, but the boot. And that change, in my opinion, is inevitable because the clerics have no legitimacy, have no popular support. The support they have is this coercive apparatus of the state, which is largely coming from countryside and the urban. These are the people who had never experienced power who lived, who were generally speaking among the urban poor or the lower middle class in, in small towns, they recruited them and created this organization which is very different from a, a, a regular <coughs> military supporting a regime. They are the regime, economically and politically. And sometimes they make statements and they take positions <coughs> that contradict some of the positions and statements that the members of the so-called parliament make. It's not, it's a, Iran is a very complicated political order, but the key to its uh, stability, the key to its ability to control the society is this rich, powerful uh, military apparatus known as the Revolutionary Guard. Yes? Would you comment on the, uh conflict between the Shia and the Sunni as regards to Syria and uh, Iran's support for Syria and Hezbollah. It's a, uh, in Syria, 
the Alawite were a wing of the Shi'i sect. Uh, they have been in power for four years. That is, they, the French encouraged this minority group to join the army. And the, the Syrian army was created by the French. In the post-World War II period, the, Middle, the Ottoman Empire was defeated, and the Middle East was divided between the British and the French. Syria was was a French colony, and they created a modern army, and invariably the colonial powers looked for minorities, looked for population groups that were more amenable to their instructions. And so they joined the army, and they engineered the coup, and they took over. 70% of the Syrians are Sunni Muslim. There are also Armenians and various you know, Christian uh, denominations in Syria, as well as a Kurdish population, except that the Kurds are also Sunni Muslim, but for the Kurds, whether they are in Syria or Iraq or Iran in Turkey, ethnic identity is far more important than religious identity. So it's very fascinating that Syria is the most secular dictatorship in the history of the region. There is no religion, and yet, because of its anti-Israeli, anti-American uh, attitude, it's an ally of Iran, and Iran justifies its alliance with Syria and its very generous assistance to Syria in the name of Islam. While in Syria, if Bashar Assad's wife walks on the streets of Tehran, she will be busted and whipped for the way she looks because she made it to the Vogue magazine. You know. <laughs> Literally, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> so it's the, the, here it's really a, 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 it's a convergence, it's a convenience of political cal conventional political calculations. So s s defeat for Syria, that the end of the Assad regime would be a blow to the Iranian uh, influence. It's the only Arab country which has good relationship with Iran. So this Shi'i Sunni business, Iranians also have been responsible for uh, uh, the, the reviving this Shi'i Sunni. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Shi'is historically they have been marginalized in many countries, including Iraq and Lebanon and all that. So they have certain legitimate grievances, but Iranians want to turn these legitimate grievances into revolutionary Islamist movement against the regime in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, in, in Lebanon, and other. But it's an old story. But it's not religion. It's not religion that is motivating the Syrians or the Iranians. It is power. It is resources. It is the desire to control. But religion is at the when religion and when religion becomes the ideology of the state, religion becomes very corrupt because it can be used in any way. As Shakespeare said it beautifully, even the devil himself can quote the scripture to make a case for himself. <laughs> so when you read the Quran, you could quote it to support anything. You could go back to the religious tradition of. Christianity, Judaism, Shi'i, Sunni, and all that, and find anything you want to justify the action. There is nothing, you know, just as we go to the Unitarian Church, they give us one interpretation of the Bible, and we go to Southern Baptist Church, they give us another interpretation of the same book. It's the same story with respect to Shi'i, Sunni. It depends on how they want to use the text for political or economic or purposes of control, and therefore they cherry pick God's revelations from the, 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 the pages they're interested in. And they haven't invented the idea, but they, they use it very frequently. <laughs> yes? How, how much influence do you see uh, Iran having in Iraq now, and what, what, what's, well, how, what's the prognosis for those two countries? It's, it's the Iraqis, when they, it's a, she is a dominating Iraq. Most of the people who were ruling in Iraq today, they lived in Iran when Saddam was in power, because Iran gave them sanctuary, including Maliki himself. And immediate, the first organized Shi'i military equipped armed group who entered Iraq after the collapse of Saddam Hussein were the 
Iraqi political, Iraqi war prisoners in Iran who were Shi'is, and the Iraqi Ayatollahs came to Iran. They trained them and they equipped them, and they entered Iraq, 12,000 of them. And they actually were in charge of security in southern part of Europe. Iran and Iraq have close relationship because ultimately the Iraqis think that the only country they can rely on would be Iran because Iran and Saudi Arabia are rivals, Iran and Egypt are rivals, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Egypt, they are very much concerned about the Shi'is being in power and decimating. The, what the Shi'is are doing to the Sunnis today is exactly what the Sunnis did to the Shi'is in the past. So they know all that. So it doesn't mean that they take order from Iran. The second source of very important uh, uh, significance of Iran for Iraq with respect is the major uh, religious uh, centers of Shi'is are in Iraq. And every year, the, Ir the Iranian tourists and the Iranian pilgrims to, uh, to Iraq they provide a very significant source of income. It was the same in Syria. One sister of an al Shi'i imam is buried, Zainab, who was supposed to be Imam Hussein's sister. She is buried in uh, Syria. Over the, before the outbreak of violence in Syria, on the average in the previous 10 years I did some research, 500,000 Iranians visited Syria which was a fantastic source of income, great tourism for, again, people with money, the, the, all income and all that. So that relationship between Iraq and Syria is very real. And in fact, the arrogance of Iran largely came after the Shi'is came to power in Iraq. It's really incredible. Politics is surreal. Here, the United States <laughs> goes to, to Iraq and overthrows one regime which is a uh, rival or enemy of Iran and bring to power the people who had been trained and equipped by Iranians. It was and in the name of in the name of you know, exporting democracy. <laughs> That's really true. <laughs> I think we should give people a chance who want to leave uh, now um, the opportunity okay. to do so, and I'm sure uh, Professor...